Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato with the great Mary Gamba, who has 12 titles so far, including executive producer of Lessons in Leadership and, of course, the co-anchor. Um, we have two very special guests from Valley Bank, uh, one of our terrific sponsors. Mary, before we bring on uh, Ivana and Jake, why don't you let everyone know who our great sponsors are, because I also know we brought in two new sponsors who are helping make Lessons in Leadership possible. Sure thing. Well, first and foremost, thank you to Valley Bank is one of our sponsors. And we also have Prager Metis, New Jersey Sharing Network, Seton Hall University and the Bacino Leadership Institute. Uh, we also have the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. And our two newest sponsors are Kessler Foundation and also Delta, Delta Dental of New Jersey. Mary, I have to smile every time you do that. Delta Dental of New Jersey. I know. We, we should do the little ding. You know how they do that, yeah. where they like they put the little shine off of the teeth yes. when we say that? Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Randy, and the team at Delta Dental. Oh, by the way, we are seen on News 12 Plus, plus 18 other platforms. We don't have time for all of them. But the primaries are, Mary? Sure. So we are on Audible. You can find us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, online at nj.com, as well as roinj.com. So we are everywhere, which is very exciting. Yeah. So Mary, introduce uh, Jake and Yvonne formally, and then we're going to get into a very substan substantive conversation about talent, leadership development, and the fact that it ain't an option, it's a must now more than ever. Go ahead, Mary. It sure is. <clears throat> it sure is. So first we have Yvonne Sorowitz. She is Senior Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer. We'll talk about what that means at Valley Bank. And then we have Jake Rahiman, Director of Talent Management at Valley Bank. Uh, let's jump right into this. Yvonne, talent development. What does it mean and what the heck does it have to do with leadership? Look, I think when we think about the future of Valley and it's all about growth, to execute on that growth strategy, we know, and we have a vision, we've actually been pretty, pretty, um, what I would say communicative in terms of what that vision is. And that's to be a hundred billion dollar bank, which is a little over twice the size that we are now. In order to be able to execute on that vision, we need leadership and we need the right leaders. And we need the leaders that have the capabilities in the future, not necessarily the capabilities today. Developing those leaders at all levels really takes a very deliberate planning in terms of what that looks like, whether it be through participation in what we call our flagship program, Steve Leadership Academy, whether it be to making sure that they have the experiences that they need that will develop them for that future role. You know, but Jake, it's interesting, the, the Valley um, Stand and Deliver Leadership Academy is a piece of a much larger, Mary and I uh, lead that, um, that effort together with Jake and the team. But that's only a piece of a much larger leadership development initiative. There are so many other things you do. First of all, there are a lot of corporations and companies we work with who say, listen, we'd love to do it, but it's too expensive. We can't make that investment, especially after COVID. We're trying to cut back. Everyone's trying to be cost conscious, but Valley has invested big. Go ahead, Jake. Yeah, I mean, Steve, you're right. I think our offerings that we have here at Valley are in our flagship programs, Leadership Academy is one of them for kind of our top level leaders, but we also have a program called Leaders in Action, um, which is kind of our mid-level managers and something that we've developed in our second co second year here at uh, called Valley Leadership Program. So the investment, you have to put the money in, right? Because you know our talent strategies in our talent management group, I have also talent acquisition and talent development is, you know, how, how do you attract develop and retain top talent. And so you you bring the people in, but you also have to have offerings that engage the individuals as we try to build the bench in the organization, but also make them future leaders. One more quick follow-up before Mary jumps in. I said to you right before we got on the air, and I said to Jake in our Leadership Academy seminars, because we do a fair number of these Leadership Academies. Um, Valley is the only bank. And by the way, let me disclose, Valley is our bank as a family. Um, and that matters because we see the service, we see the the way those um, those branches are managed, and it makes a difference. The people are all that matters. They they matter most, and they're very talented and caring. That being said, I said to Jake that the people that you have selected to be in the leadership academy have that's three quarters of the success because half the time, Mary and I, no names to be mentioned, other companies and organizations. What are they doing in the leadership academy? Why did they put them in? This person doesn't want to be in. He or she thinks they're as good as they're going to get. They're resistant to feedback. They don't show up to the seminars. That's not the same at Valley. And this is not a commercial for Valley. It's a fact. Yvonne. 
You know, we're fortunate. I think we have commitment from our entire leadership team in terms of the importance of assessing talent. And we have a cadence in place where we have a formal assessment of our ta talent on an annual basis. And what we do is we create a shared understanding of that talent. It's not just, it's not talent that belongs to one leader. Our talent pool is really Valley's talent pool. So it's important for us to understand what that talent pool looks like and to have some shared understanding in terms of what the expectations are in terms of performance or what that individual can do for Valley. And so with that, then we have those conversations that really create sort of a shared understanding in terms of what we're looking for in future leadership. Well said, by the way, as Mary jumps in, put in the website for Valley who, for people who want to find out more about the bank and not only the bank and what his services, but the other thing is huge. Valley is huge when it comes to community investment in not-for-profit organizations. And we know that well. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, sure thing. So Jake and Ivana, have you been talking? I've been thinking a lot about culture and DNA. For most organizations, that culture is really what uh, is outwardly facing to the community. However, as you've grown as a bank, as you have merged and acquired- gets bigger. It, you've been getting bigger. How do you continue to instill? I mean, we've had Ira Robbins, your president and CEO mm -hmm. on many times talking about the culture. How does that work so well when you have so many people at Valley? It, I, I have to say Ira is a champion of culture and it does start at the top. I know it's overused, you know, the CEO owns culture, but the reality is that the CEO does drive the message from the top down. And, you know, as we've grown, whether it be across sort of the geographies or in terms of how we think about the talent that we need, we've brought on people from other industries. So we, we don't only have banking professionals. Those individuals have influenced our culture for sure in a positive way. So there, there are elements of Valley's culture that are our secret sauce. And then there are also elements of culture that have been brought in that we've capitalized on that have actually made Valley's culture stronger. We also, from a culture perspective, I mean, we try to be a listening culture. So we, like most organizations, we do like engagement surveys, try to get the feedback, try to listen to the employees. And what we've heard from the associates in a lot of cases, and we've kind of bucketed them into kind of three, call them commitments in some cases, they're focused on career growth. They're focused on collaboration and communication. They're focused on innovation. Those are the three areas that they want us to hone in on. And so we've kind of built not just our HR pieces, but I think organizationally to try to deliver, you know, for the culture of the organization and what the associates want, you know, to grow on. And so I think that's the culture that we're also creating here at Valley. One more quickie. Hey, Mary and I, we, and Mary's wondering why I keep bringing up work-life balance, why I keep talking about exercise, fitness, I'm going for a walk around the block, whatever it is. And it's simple because I've been doing more and more reading about and research on the connection between leadership um, wellness and not thinking you can just work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I'm going to power through this. I know that for Yvonne and for Jake, balance matters. Without giving up too much detail, Yvonne, how do you find balance work life combined with taking care of yourself? Because it so, matters. It does matter. But I'll tell you, Steve, that word balance, I like to kind of refer to it as work life integration. Because there's no, there's really, you know, and, and there's a, there's a scale in terms of how that, how that kind of works. What I will say, though, is it's different for everyone. It really is. It's not a one size fits all. And what's important to one individual may be different for somebody else who has different obligations or who's in a different place from a family perspective. I personally have um, always, always incorporated exercise in my own, you know, routine. And it, and, and I've done that intentionally because it helps me be sort of stronger at what I do. It gives me energy. How? How? Um, I think it, it, look, it's proven exercise releases stress. But for me, I have some of my greatest thinking if I'm, and I'll say it, I'll commercial for Peloton, if I'm on the Peloton or if I'm running, it just frees up that other noise. And all of a sudden I'll have this, you know, solution to a problem that I haven't been able to figure out for weeks. So I think for me, I think it's important, may not be as important for somebody else, but then right. something else may be important for them. And I may be a morning person, somebody else may need, you know, time in the evening. So it, 
for us, I think from a Valley perspective, we definitely stress well-being. It's been a really tough year. People, mm. people have felt loneliness. They felt other emotions that you know were exasperated by what we all went through. So for us, I think empathy is a big thing, like to understand where somebody's coming from. Jake's absolutely right. We've learned to be better listeners. And I think that creates sort of a healthier environment for all of us. And by the way, again, we're not going to make a commercial for Peloton, but check out the interview. I know that our team's going to put up the Stand and Deliver website. Check out the interview we did with uh, John Foley, who is the founder of Peloton. He tells a story of how Peloton was created. And by the way, well, it's, whether it's Peloton, walking around the block, running, exactly. taekwondo, um, I, I do, I'm big into Pilates and some other stuff. doesn't matter. Something. Jake, go. What's your yeah. story? So, so my story, it's, I, again, I'll just say from a personal perspective, it's, it's hard. Everyone here at Valley, but I can imagine that most organizations are committed to their jobs. And, and so the co in COVID, it's really created a challenge for everyone because people are working remotely, you know, day slips into night. So we've been encouraging folks to take breaks as, as much as possible. If you're working remotely or if you're in the office, you know, try to, to break up your, your time. For me personally, I'm committed, but on weekends I go into the city and I, people think I'm kind of nuts, but I power walk maybe 15 miles. I mean, it, it, it goes on for hours. Do you really? I <laughs> what, what, hold on. Jay, where do you what? go? I, I'm trying yeah. to visualize. How do you know What's where to start and plan? end? So, so I'm a creature of habit, which is good or bad. Um, but in Central Park, in the lower loop, the lower loop is about two miles. So I yeah. do it about six or seven times. And, you know, I have my music in and I'm thinking and I take a break or I might run during the piece of time. But that's my I can't do it every day, but that's my. My, my my jake time to kind of recharge and again you're going to hear from everyone everyone has their own stories of how they do it whether they do it daily or for me it's it's saturdays and sundays in the park and it's just because I'm, I'm from the city but i love new jersey so it gives me a connection to be in central park and see people too so that's my I love it. by the way mary doesn't do all those miles but she walks at about five o'clock and i've made the mistake yvonne and jake uh, of calling mary it's ridiculous i call her too often Mary, I have an idea. It's five thirty. She goes, "I'm walking. Yep. I can't talk to you now." And she did. That's it. No, and I, I, I talked to you for a second. I'm like, "Is it urgent?" No. Okay. Well, we'll talk when I get back. That's. And, and again, I should I should get in the habit of not even bringing my phone. But with a 16 year old and a 19 year old, you never know when they're going to need something. And, and a needy, it's true. And a needy partner. Yep. So every morning, same thing. I, I hit the Peloton, not a commercial, but it's great. And uh, yeah. Steve's cracking himself yeah. up over there. <laughs> no, I know. Listen, I should, I should stop. I'm going to make a promise, Mary. No more calls between five and six. Okay. We'll see. In how the morning. That is that okay? That's okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, like I'm like kidding. Hey, listen, I, I have to do this. We have Ira on a, a lot because he's just a great friend that we learned from him. And, and Fally's been great. And he's smart, real smart as a leader. He's evolved. I've known Ira for 12 or 13 years. He's evolved. So here's my question to you, Yvonne. Last 16 to 18 months, let's start early 2020. We're taping this in the midsummer of 2021. We'll be seen later. One way that you, Yvonne, have evolved as a leader is? Oh, for me, Steve. <laughs> One way I asked I... Ira the same thing, so go ahead. Oh, wow, that's a tough question. I have to think about it because there's many ways. So I'm, I am a perpetual learner and I love to learn. And I think, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that the pandemic really sort of put things in perspective. And in, in terms of how I personally evolved as a leader, I'll go back to that word empathy. I, I really do believe that I'm much more understanding now and really trying to seek where someone's coming from versus assuming. So, and, and understanding everybody's really kind of unique and different and, they, and they're really, you know, in a different place. I think I've, from that perspective, I think I've definitely involved, I guess I'm softer. <laughs> well, well but, but hold on one second. Can you still be a type A productive bottom line, we got to get it done leader with, while still having, Jake is shaking his head with still the same degree of empathy? Completely. I mean, wow. I think I think you can be a. I think you can absolutely. And quite honestly, I think you get you get people to really um, value the organization when they know that they're cared for. They may not like the decisions that you're making. People aren't all crazy about us saying it's time to kind of come back. 
yet at the same time, if you kind of give them the why and at least understand where they're coming from, it helps inform some things and, and, and gives you an opportunity to kind of evaluate whether you're making the strongest decisions. Yeah, uh, Dr. Daniel Goldman, I say all the time, is an expert on emotional intelligence. And one of the keys to emotional intelligence is this high degree of empathy. And Yvonne just communicated that. Jake, one area where, how, where and how you've evolved as a leader in the last year and a half is? So I'm fortunate because, I, again, I have a kind of a large team on talent acquisition and, and talent management. I, the pandemic kind of threw me for a loop, too. And again, I, I'll just talk personally. Some of us were affected with COVID and, and kind of had to recover in addition to kind of working remotely, it gave us a lot of focus. You, 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 you're doing 15 different things at one time. You got to focus on one thing first and get that right and move on to the next thing. And, and all of us want to multitask and do 14 things. And I found it very challenging being remote and even in the office. I think the laser focus that you have to kind of deliver, Yvonne and I talk about outcomes. What is the outcome that's ultimately going to happen? And you want to be intentional with that outcome. And if you don't have that focus um, on the one key task at hand, you're not going to deliver. So we've been really kind of focused on that. Hey, Mary, I haven't asked you. 18 months, mm -hmm. most significant. You, you keep evolving and growing, getting better. One way that you've evolved and changed as a leader is? Oh, it, it is without a doubt to be present. And it's something that all my life I know that I struggled with and I still struggle with to this day. And the pandemic really forced me to be, you know, where I am at any given moment, to be present, to not always be thinking about the next thing. I always used to joke, I, I hate getting massages uh, because I'm just laying there and I'm like, all right, what am I going to do as soon as I leave? I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to go to the supermarket. I'm going through my mental to-do list. So I'm really trying to focus on being present. I think the pandemic truly helped all of us just to slow down and realize what really matters and to be more patient with ourselves and just be more present. Mary. Thank you. You're going to stay right there. But to Yvonne and Jake, cannot thank you, both of you enough. Thank Ira. Thank Valley for not just sponsoring lessons in leadership. You know, they often say no money, no mission. Uh, investing in us. But the other thing is giving us an opportunity to work with your talented people and help them grow just a little bit because we grow in the process. Yvonne and Jake, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. That's Jake. That's Yvonne. That's Mary. I'm Steve. Lessons in Leadership. We'll be right back. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been brought to you by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen, and I got my life back. The Sharing Network means to me hope, life, and everything. The Sharing Network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. Pay tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato with Mary Gamba. Hey, some people call him Jim Kirkos, but originally it's Kirkus. And he is, in fact, president and CEO of Meadowlands Chamber. There's about a 10-minute conversation about your name. Jim, originally it was Kirkus, right? That's, that's correct. I started out my whole life uh, being called Jim Kirkus, and then somewhere along the line, somebody called me Kirkos, and it's kind of stuck. So it's all good. And you, and, and you know what Jim goes along with? He's flexible. Let me just say that. By the way, Jim is a board member, uh, a trustee of our caucus educational corporation, a longtime media partner with Meadowlands Chamber. Let's put up their website so that everyone can drive to the website and see the great stuff they have going. Hey, Jim, um, I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time along with Mary because one of our new sponsors, Delta Dental New Jersey, big into small business. We'll see their logo as we do this right now. Small business leadership. 
What's it look like, uh, particularly in the second half of 2021 going into 2022? What does small business leadership look like? Well, I think from my perspective, see, first of all, I also want to comment about uh, the team at, at Delta Dental. They are fabulous supporters of organizations like ours. They, they're like Special they're, Olympics as well. Yep, and their lead, their leadership team is is really good about helping uh, people like myself who lead business organizations figure out ways to help lead those small, especially those small companies that need the assistance coming out of this pandemic in these trying times. Uh, and helping us to be better leaders, not only individually, but but as as an organization. And so, kudos to uh, to uh, to Dennis, to Dennis and, and Randy and the team there. Yep, kudos. So I think I think from from my perspective, Steve, the the uh, small business community uh, continues to need uh, some vision and some leadership as we're coming out of this pandemic. And you know, when you, when you go through the adversity that most small businesses have gone through during the pandemic, it's hard to see a clear picture of what the future looks like. You know, we're, you know, I, I, I preach uh, vision all the time here. A lot of things that we do as an organization is, is produce vision plans for what we want to aspire to as an organization, as a region from an economic development standpoint, but it's hard for small businesses to see that when they're going through such tough economic times. So I find that our job and my job as a, as a leader of an organization like this is to make sure we're constantly trying to keep that vision clear, keep people focused on what the possibilities are. Because in every crisis, there are opportunities, but small businesses have a hard time trying to figure out their way through that to see those opportunities. Yeah. And by the way, let's make sure when you go on the website for metalands.org, um, they'll tell you all the, it'll share all the services that they have to offer. Mary, jump in. Yeah. I, I sometimes swear you and I share a brain. I was just going to ask Jim, just share a little bit about what the chamber is, what it does. I know there's a lot of people watching who probably don't understand what the Meadowlands Chamber is and what you do provide. So thank you, Mary. Uh, so the Chamber is a business service organization, our particular organization, uh, and there are chambers throughout the state that are that are that are really uh, terrific. And I collaborate with my colleagues, uh, especially Tom Bracken at the State Chamber, who does a, a terrific job at leading. Uh, especially on the big picture issues in Trenton. But business organizations like our regional uh, chamber, you know, we are, we are an economic development, business, climate uh, uh, entity that does business education, networking, uh, and relationship building, uh, and, and, and trying to help just build that economy in the region so that our members can prosper and grow. And we tackle the issues along the way that need to be tackled. Up here in the Meadowlands, you know, we've been very big in transportation infrastructure advocacy, workforce development, yep. flood, flood mitigation, all the things that would hamper business opportunities. Uh, being a champion of the of destination assets at the sports complex, and you know that I've been a champion of American Dream. All yeah, I was just going to say that you have some new things going on there. I, I read about a new aquarium that's happening there, and I'm sure now that COVID restrictions have lifted, will there be some concerts and other type of uh, events going on? Yeah, as a matter of fact, MetLife Stadium is announcing almost weekly new event dates. Uh, Elton John is going to be is, uh, doing his Yellow Brick Road tour right through uh, the Meadowlands, which which we love. Uh, and a lot of other concerts as we get into football season. Football season will be back to normal at full capacity. And yeah, you talked about the Sea Life Aquarium. We cut the ribbon on it uh, a week or so ago, and it is absolutely spectacular. I felt like a little kid again. Looking I at love all aquariums. It's, it's, it's really terrific. But Jim, the other thing that's going on is, and I know this about Jim, yeah, bottom line guy, trying to help businesses uh, meet their bottom line. Also, the Meadowlands Chamber has to have a bottom line they meet. He's a business person, but he also gives back. I know he's very much connected to the folks at Hackensack uh, University Medical Center, but also the sharing network of New Jersey, um, Joe Roth, Elise Glennon. And I also know that because you're on the board there and Elise is on the board, uh, with you, with our corporation, the Caucus Educational Corporation. Here's the point. Why are you so committed, so committed to the sharing network? And what the heck does that have to do with leadership and business? Well, I'll tell you, it, it has a lot to do with business because, you know, as we talk about building a strong economy, you have to have a strong quality of life, right? They go hand in hand. So we've never been just about the economy here at this organization, at the Meadowlands Chamber. We, we, we have a very vibrant not-for-profit 
uh, membership. We have 22 not-for-profits that are members here. The Sharing Network has got a piece of my heart uh, only because I was so touched by what they do and the lives that they save and the, and the lives that they impact. Uh, and Elise was a chairwoman here. Elise Glennon was a chairwoman here at our organization. And so, so to, to help that organization the way they change so many lives and, and improve the quality of life for, for people, that is equally as important to build an economy as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, by the way, their website will have been up throughout the entire time. Mary will make sure we do that so people can go on to the New Jersey Sharing Network website to find out more about organ and tissue donation and also what you can do to give the gift of life to someone else. Mary, go ahead. We've got a couple of minutes left with Jim. Yeah, definitely, Jim. Uh, we've talked about this with so many of our guests. In terms of the biggest leadership lesson that you've learned over the pandemic, and I always love to ask this question because you would think that everyone would say the same thing. Oh, the ability to pivot, this and that. We have heard such an array of responses. What is the biggest leadership lesson that you've learned over the last 18 plus months by the time this airs throughout the uh, COVID pandemic? Uh, well, Mary, great question. I, you, you've heard me talk about this before on, on, on this program about being a good listener, but but I have a, I have a new one that's really that's really come to full circle uh, for me during the pandemic, and that is me not as a leader not being afraid or having the courage to be vulnerable and honest with the people that I'm talking to. And my and what do you what do you mean by vulnerable? Sorry to interrupt you, but what do you mean by vulnerable? In what way? So we did lots of we did lots of business uh, uh, virtual uh, discussions with business owners, and I shared with them my own my own fears mm. about what the future was like. I, I said I wasn't going to stop, I wasn't going to let it deter me, but I shared with them what was going on inside of me. It was why, important. Jim? Why? Well, why? Let me play devil's advocate. Yeah. Um, never let anyone see you sweat. Never let anyone see your vulnerability. Show confidence, even whether you don't really have it, you have it or not. Again, all cliches. You you didn't. Why? Well, I didn't because I think it's so. So don't don't equate the vulnerability and being honest with that vulnerability with the lack of confidence. I expressed hmm. confidence that I could get through it, but I was also letting people know of what my of what my concerns were, what my fears were, and how I was tackling them personally. You know, in in my organization and what I was going to do to to build the, to rebuild the chamber to make sure that nothing stopped us from succeeding. And and that authenticity, Steve, as a as a leader is, is really important. People need to see me as being honest and authentic and not afraid to, to talk about the things that I fear. That I, I, I think that there's a strength in that. What is it I agree, I, Jim, Jim, I'm sorry to right. interrupt you, Steve. I was just gonna say, I agree completely. I think it's so important to share. If you do have fears, it shows that you're human and it makes those around you also feel human and not feel less than because they're feeling a particular way. Yeah, and, and Mary, I was trying to I was trying to bring out in our in my members what their fears were, so we could openly talk about it. And I felt like as a leader, if I was openly talking about the things that I was concerned about, that they would be able to do the same because they needed to address it. Right? Small business owners need to address their fears so they can get by it. And if they put it away, too many bad things can happen when they hide it. You know, as as we wrap up this show, Jim, you're raising. By the way, the Pandora's box is about to explode in my head right now, because for years, the leadership lessons or the book on leadership has said, even if you're afraid, even if you're feeling vulnerable, even if you're insecure, you never let your team know it because they, if they see that in you, it pervades in them. Jim Kirkus is saying, listen, we're all feeling it. Don't act like you're not. And if you put it out there and allow others to put it out there, we have a better chance to be shoulder to shoulder supporting each other and getting it done. It's a different way of looking at it. Hey, Jim, not only for being a great leader at the Meadowlands Chamber and being a trustee of the Caucus Educational Corporation, just a great friend and you keep doing important work. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for continuing to have me on, Steve and Mary. Thank you. By the way, I love his new logo, right, Mary? I love it. I love, I love the, the background. background. It's just the background's incredible. It looked like a fake background. I love it. But it's real. Mary, it's real. Steve, Jim, lessons in leadership. Catch you next time. Thanks. Thank you. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been brought to you by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, 
showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.